Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Thursday edition of the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. I'm Dan Lobby with Mary Kay Cabot and Ashley Bastock. So we're going to do a little bit of a season recap here, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. Uh, just a quick one. We're hoping to get a, a kind of a big season ending roundtable here together in the next day or two. So I thought like today we were all on this beat every day from July. Well, Almost every day, as you'll probably hear at some point on this podcast. Every day from July until the season ended, we're still going. Um, And so this is sort of a chance to look back and pick out some moments. So here's what we've got. We're going to do most memorable game. We're going to do our favorite story that we wrote this year. We're going to do the kind of downer question of when did you kind of know it was over for this team? And then the most bizarre moment uh, of the year that we can can remember so let's just start mary Kay. what was your most memorable game and this doesn't have to be a win it 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 can be memorable for any reason just the most memorable game of the 2022 season you know i think it has to be the deshaun watson game in houston i mean my goodness uh the magnitude of that game the the emotion before the game uh there were so many things uh about it uh you know i went down onto the field beforehand. And I had my, um, you know, I had my, my phone with me and I was videotaping some things. So I got an opportunity to watch all these Browns fans getting autographs from Deshaun. I watched him, you know, walk out for warmups. I got that on video. Um, uh, you know, his agent showed up down there, his marketing guy showed up. Uh, there were, you know, there were so many people on the sidelines and then, uh, Kevin Stefanski was down there. Then his family showed up on the sidelines. Uh, so you had his wife and his kids were there. I mean, it was almost like a circus atmosphere. It was really, really, really crazy down there. Um, and it was just, you know, it, it was just the game that we had basically been all waiting for all season long, him returning to the field after 700 days off, returning to the city where all of those accusations and allegations took place, returning after an 11 game suspension. And how was this all going to go? And as it turned out, uh, he was way rustier than any of us thought possible. I don't think anybody expected him to be that rusty. It was, it almost looked like at times his legs didn't work right and his arm didn't work right. And I think that was because the emotion of this game was so overwhelming. Uh, I think everybody underestimated the impact that that was going to have on him. Okay, so I was not at this game. We'll get into this a little bit later. I was not at that game because I had COVID that week and missed the entire week, was not able to, to travel to Houston. So I missed that one. Ashley, is that your answer for this? Because you were at that game. Or, yeah. or do you have another one? Well, that was going to be my answer, but I think there's another one that we that I could talk about for the sake of this discussion. Um, but Mary Kay hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's the game I think we're all going to look back on from this season and remember. But for me, I'm also really going to remember the Halloween night game against the Bengals. Like, obviously, it's the AFC North rivalry. Um, but to me, it kind of represents for better and worse, like where this team was this season. Um, and the best and worst parts of it, like they're a team that's built to beat the Bengals. We've joked like they're joked to they're built to win this rivalry. It feels like in a lot of ways. And, you know, I said on a recent podcast, like for a lot of the season, I felt like they were just kind of like a front running team. And I think you saw it there and you saw them, you know, maybe get a little too confident, overconfident after that win. And I think things kind of spiraled after that. But I do think it just kind of shows like what this defense is built to stop, especially. Um, and I'm always, I always just kind of those wins against the Bengals just stick with me a lot. I think these AFC North games probably stick with all of us a lot more, but they they just matched up so well against Cincy in that game for, for better and for worse. Yeah. That, that was one that I had on my list too, as a possibility, Mary Kay, that just that crazy. And, and they were floundering going into that game. It, like it was falling apart. And then they just, come out and just destroy the Bengals on Monday night football, <laughs> like going into their bye week, just a really strange night with Miles yeah, Garrett it, dressed as Vecna, by the way. 
<laughs> yeah, that it was the Stranger Things kind of night. I mean, that was the whole theme of the night. And again, he showed up that way uh, in, in costume and he kind of went out and uh, sort of played that way. But I think the thing to remember about that, too, is, you know, I mean, Jamar Chase did not play in that football game. And uh, I think the Browns found out uh, the hard way that uh, that had a lot to do with them being able to win that football game. And they're going to have to bring it a little stronger than that the next time they play the Bengals because they caught an enormous break that night. And truthfully, if he had played that game, I mean, they they could have six victories right now. I mean, there's so many games you could go back and look at and think, geez, if only this happened. I mean, it could have gone either way. Enough of them could have gone either way that they probably ended up right about where they should be. But um, but that was another thing that stood out to me about that game. Does that game prove that the Bengals are a, a tougher team to beat when T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd aren't on the field? <laughs> is that is that the proof of concept? Maybe I had Maybe. I had um, I, gosh I, I have like two that I really like, but I think I have to pick I have to pick this one. It's Week One. That was just such a mm-hmm. Baker Mayfield. And of course, you know, the whole dust up with Baker saying something that maybe shouldn't have been reported, but it did get reported. Just the entire Baker experience leading up to that game, the off the leash t-shirts. And then the way it ended, I, I mean, the Browns were going to lose that game. I like, ironically, if that's the right word, they were going to lose that game on a Baker Mayfield game winning drive, which <laughs> would have been almost perfect. But then here comes this rookie kicker. And he makes this 58 yard field goal at just the, at the perfect time for Ashley. And yeah. uh, which, which maybe we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and just that, mo- it was just such a, you know, these ends of games are so crazy for us, right? Cause we're all trying to get something written and posted as soon as that clock hits zero. And then we got to get downstairs and do interviews and Mary Kay's figuring out if she's going to go to Baker's presser or go to the Browns, but like, it's just chaos. And just all of that ending with Cade York kicking this 58 yard field goal is just that that's just one of those moments. I don't think you'll, you'll ever forget. Yeah. You know what? You're so right about that, Dan. There was so, there was so much build up to that game. There was so much hype to that game. And I thought that it was going to, you know, I thought they were going to dispatch them with ease and that certainly didn't happen. Uh, that was, you know, the first sign that things might not be going this season the way that we all thought that they were going to go. And one of the biggest takeaways that I have from that game, I did, by the way, go to the, uh, Baker Mayfield press conference, and he was cordial with the uh, Browns reporters that were over there. We asked him a number of questions, and he was very professional with the way he answered that. But I do remember that they were upset over there. They were really mad. They felt they got robbed on a couple of calls at the end of the game. And in some ways, you know, they they seem to have a little bit of a, a strong case. One of the things that happened, of course, right there at the end was that um, Jacoby Brissett executed. He had little, uh, like a little balk on a spike. And, um, and the officials at first threw a flag on that, and it would have been a 10-yard penalty. And, um, and, so, and then the, the officials picked up the flag, okay? If they had not picked up the flag, it would have been a 68-yard field goal and three seconds left to pull it off. Okay. Now, is that happening, anybody? No, that's not happening. There was no way they were going to win that football game if the officials did not pick up that flag on that spike. And then later, um, I came to find out that Amari Cooper uh, had misstepped. He had done something wrong on that on that spike that you know he admit, admitted that to me afterwards that he made a mistake on that so he was as happy as everyone that as anyone else that they picked up the spike flag uh because if they hadn't done that there's no way they were starting out zero and one yeah ashley i mean just uh, it's hard to really capture that and, and, and it was week one right on top of everything else it was week one which is just always a, a crazy time anyway in a road game yeah, I mean, and especially the the Cade York kind of moment at the end, I think there had been so much Cade York buildup throughout training camp and, you know, every day that 
we'd be out there and, and the parts that we can record. I think every reporter was out there recording his, you know, kicks where he was progressively going further and further back and hitting these crazy 60 yard kicks. You know, I think I kept track of it for us. I think he only missed like two kicks that we saw throughout camp. So there had just been such this buildup and he kind of like, became a folk hero overnight. <laughs> and like Dan said, it ended up being really good timing for the stakeout I had been working on for like the month prior. Um, but yeah, it just kind of, I think, showed like, hey, like Mary Kay said, like the season's not going to be as easy or like some of these games might not be as easy as we thought. I remember, you know, talking about those first four games, how winnable we all thought they were and on paper they were. Um, and then we kind of saw what happened at the end of those first four and through Jacoby's time here, you know, as a starter, only getting those four wins. So I do think it kind of like set the tone for the season in a lot of ways, like maybe underperforming a little bit, having to rely on people you weren't necessarily expecting to younger guys performing maybe a bit more than you weren't expecting them to. And then on the flip side of that, those younger guys as the season went on making some mistakes because they're younger players. All right. Here's a real downer of a question. (laughs) When, when did you know it was over? When, when did you first kind of realize like, uh, I don't think this team's going to do it this year. They're they're not going to get to the playoffs, and this thing is done. Mine is probably like eighteen weeks earlier than than your guys. But <laughs> <laughs> Mary Kay, when when did you sort of walk away from a game feeling like, all right, this thing is this thing's done. It's not going to happen. You know, it was towards the end. You know, it was towards the end of, of Jacoby when it was getting to the point where he wasn't going to be handing over five or six victories. So um, take me back. Does somebody have the schedule up? I mean, it wasn't the last one. Yeah, I do. It was, it was well, earlier. I can tell than- you what mine was. Like around the bye week, you know, after Miami, Miami was mine. So like after the bye week, they had Miami, yeah. the Bills game, the Bucks game before the Texans. Um, yeah. And right before the bye week, it was the Ravens and Bengals games. Yeah, it was it was right. You know, it was a couple games before the end of Jacoby where you just realized, oh, they're not handing over five or six victories because we had said all along that that's what it was going to take to keep them in the playoff hunt. And again, had the defense and the special teams done their job, Jacoby did enough. OK, he did enough. But the defense and the special teams really let down the Browns in the uh, in the early going in the first half of the season. Um, so the, it, it really and, and I, I have to just say this. I completely disagree with the notion that they punted on the season once they realized that Deshaun Watson was going to be suspended for 11 games. There's no way that they were going to do that. They've got I keep saying this over and over and over. They've got $46 million a year invested in him. They were not going to throw one chunk of that that $46 million right out the window. They needed to do everything they possibly could to make the playoffs. And I think they believed that Jacoby was an upgrade over Baker Mayfield and that he would be able to hold down the fort for them, that they should have been able to go six and five with Jacoby. They should have been able to. They should have been able to play just over 500 ball. But uh, it became evident, you know, late in the Jacoby era <laughs> that uh, that, it, that it wasn't going to happen. So it was right. It was probably the, you know, Jacoby's whatever, you know, eighth game or, or so where it was like, no, nope, this is not happening. So, Ashley, I think you and I have the same one then. Uh, Miami. Because yeah. I was thinking I was thinking Miami. Yeah, it was like, that was just such a beatdown. I'm kind of like, I think I wrote, you know, after that game, I remember writing like, hey, they just basically did what like the Chargers did and what the Falcons did. Well, mainly the Chargers, because they were this really pass heavy team that we kind of expected to just, you know, stick with what they do and dominate them through the air. And they didn't. They ran the ball a bunch and got a season high total in rushing yards for that game. Um, And I just knew at that point, I think I wrote like, Deshaun Watson wasn't going to save this team when he came back. And like Mary Kay said, by that point, we already kind of knew they weren't going to be handing him enough wins to make that really feasible. But it was just the fact that like the problems weren't what Jacoby Brissett was doing. It's not like he was the the scapegoat for all of this. It was the defense just looked so like beaten down or broken down at that point that I kind of figured like it was going to be too late to to turn the ship around. And and just coming out of the bye week just all of like you expect yeah, that's the other part performance of it. out of the bye and just, and then, you know, we all knew they had Buffalo coming the next week. We obviously had no idea 
how how much that game was going to go off the ra- the rails with where it was played and and whatnot. But um, yeah, it was just that game was the one. You know, the Chargers game was bad. The Chargers game exposed a lot of flaws, and like the Patriots game was really bad. But it was too early in the season to say like, oh, it's over after those games. That Miami game was like the one that was like, oh, this really, yeah, this really might be a problem. Okay, let's take a break, and then we've got a couple more questions. Uh, these don't really have to do with uh, with games. These are more about kind of covering the team. So we'll get to those uh, on the other side here. NIL Now, a podcast dedicated to the name, image, and likeness of today's college and high school athletes. NIL is not a cherry on top. It needs to be thought about as a part of these young men and women's future as a nest egg for something when something goes wrong. You know, there's less than 1% of these football players make it to the NFL. You know, their plan B is sometimes not as lofty as plan A. This NIL thing, when you when you ask what's the next important thing, is to make sure that these players are coming to school for education, sports, but also NIL is a close third in that. It's an investment into these players now that they can take advantage of or leverage their name, image, and likeness to you know further their careers. So now you have a nest egg after you've invested so much time into your skill set in college. You should be able to leave college with something. This is NIL Now. And welcome back to the Orange or Brown Talk podcast. So I've got a couple questions here about some stuff we've written. And then lastly, uh, the most bizarre moment, uh, which I thought, let's just call it the most bizarre week. Let's just call it what it is. The most bizarre week, because I think we all have the same thing. Uh, Mm -hmm. First of all, favorite story you wrote this year. Mary Kay, what do you have? Uh, You know, I'm going to go with one of the first ones that I did this season, and that was when I sat down with uh, rookie receiver Michael Woods during training camp, and uh, we just started uh, talking about, you know, just his life and his background and all that kind of stuff. And as it turns out, uh, when he was, I can't remember how exactly now how old he was, four years old, I think he was at the time, uh, where he ended up at the bottom of a pool. And he uh, and he was he had a near death experience. He saw himself from above. Uh, he had to be resuscitated. Uh, he was you know rushed to the hospital. They got you know they got him out of there. They rushed him to revived him. Rushed him to the hospital. You know he was obviously very 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 lucky to be alive. And um, and you know he became part of a sort of like a children's miracle kind of situation where he was. Um, you know, he, he got special little treatment and things like that and got to meet, I think he got to meet an athlete. Um, but it, it was a very interesting story. I got a chance to talk to his mom about just what a harrowing experience that was to almost, you know, lose her son to a drowning in their backyard pool. Um, and, and it was just a cool story for Michael because, you know, it was, it was kind of in a way life changing for him because he really sort of became a spiritual person uh, from that because he does remember kind of, you know, seeing the light and seeing himself from above and just having one of those classic near death death experiences, even as a four year old. So it was just something that I wasn't expecting. He was playing well in training camp and I just wanted to just talk to him and see, you know, who he was and how he was doing. And uh, you know, and sometimes you just get, you know, a little bit fortunate there and you get more than you bargained for. And I did that day and I just really like Michael Woods a lot. Uh, He is an amazing young man and I think he's got the potential to be a good receiver in the NFL. And I, for one, am pulling for him. Yeah, that was, that was definitely one of those kind of out of nowhere. Like you didn't, you didn't expect to get that story when you went into that interview. So uh, you kind of halfway through, you hear something and you're like, okay, I guess I'm calling an audible on this one. (laughs) uh, Yes. It it gets a little crazy after that. Uh, Ashley, what about you? Yeah. I mean, I think I really have two. And the first one is my Cade York takeout. And we, we alluded to it already. I've been working on that story like in training camp I started and just kind of talking to all these people who knew him and really, I think dive getting a chance early on to talk about the fact, like 
there was this narrative of him coming out of LSU, right, that he was, like, so good, and he was. But, like, his freshman year wasn't so good at LSU. Like, he did go through some struggles there. So that was the first time kind of talking about that, and I think that ended up being – um, fitting in a lot of ways because he ended up going through a lot of the same struggles this season. And he, because I think I had developed that rapport with him from doing the big story, then he was willing to talk to me one-on-one about some of those issues. So got a nice story out of that a couple of weeks ago, I thought. Um, and then from the, the craziest week, I have to mention the shout out the Anthony Schwartz mental health story. Um, that was one that I didn't, you know, kind of expect or didn't know what was happening with it going into that week. There was obviously a lot going on and, um, you know, Anthony's obviously had a very tough time here and ended the year on IR, which is unfortunate and who knows what his future is going to hold. But, um, I still always commend athletes when they're willing to talk about anxiety or, or mental health. And I've, I've dealt with those own issues in my life too. So I think it's, um, I understand how hard it is and that it's not the easiest thing to talk about. And, um, I'll, I'm, I'm really grateful that he was willing to, to share that with us. Okay. I'm going to let you guys into my process a little bit here. <laughs> So when I, when I request a guy in training camp, the process is usually it's like 10 o'clock at night and I'm like, Oh, I think I want to talk to this guy. So I email Dan Murphy and and see if I can get him the next day. That's how I plan. That's how I plan for things as (laughs) as we go through the season. Uh, But this one, this was one that I like really wanted to do. And I wasn't sure how it was going to go because it was, it was the Amari Cooper interview. And I wanted to ask him like, it was all based on me wanting to ask him is route running an art or a science, which is kind of a dumb question, but I wanted to ask him and I had no idea if he would take the bait or not and give me any good answers. And he ended up doing that. And you know, sometimes you go into these interviews and you have a plan and it works. And sometimes you go in and you have a plan and it's a disaster and you you have to pivot. So I got really lucky on that one, especially because we learned about Amari over the course of his time here, that if he doesn't, want to answer a question he's not going to fake it so it's always one of those players where it's always a little bit of a risk uh if you ask the wrong question so uh, he ended up giving me a really good interview on a really like on on a day that was not really it was hot he had just practiced like it was not a great day to stand out there and interview a guy for 20 minutes so uh just got really lucky on, on that one um but yeah, yeah I was going to was... say you guys, you guys stood out like to give people a, an idea like Dan and Amari stood out in the sun. There was like no tent where they were standing, no shade. And he talked to Dan for like 20 minutes and he was like sweating. And Dan said, I remember you saying like, oh, I just, he just kept going. He was so good, but like he's huffing and puffing. Like he was, he had literally just come off the field. And I mean, it was, it ended up being a great, I think, peek into, into who he is before the season started. But, but the other thing about that is, is that, you know, you can say, that you got lucky, but you really didn't get lucky. You came up with a really cool question. And yeah. the way that you framed the question, uh, you know, inspired him to give you that good interview. So there's a little bit more than luck involved in something like that. I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, one, like I, I think one of the cool things kind of working together is we all get to kind of see these stories come together. Like I know with Ashley's Kate York story, I felt like, I was there for like the whole process of putting that story together. I don't, I don't think I ever read that one before it went live, but I (laughs) kind of got to see every step of the way. And I know like Mary Kay, I actually watched you interview Michael Woods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Oh, yeah, there's something going on (laughs) over there. And you told me about it like shortly after and like, Oh yeah, that's a really good story. So, so that's one of the cool things uh, about being together for all those months, like we get to see all these stories come together and, and you kind of see these moments and Mary Kay or Martin Emerson story. Yeah. Uh, that's another one that, uh, yeah. that took a, that took a lot of effort to, to pull together in the middle of a season. Well, you know, that was another one where I certainly did not go into that interview with Martin Emerson expecting to get what I got. And early on in this one-on-one interview that I got to have with him, which I'm always so grateful to get the access to, to be able to do that. Um, you know, he just, you know, we just started talking and, and having a conversation and, and he, you know, first mentioned that his, you know, he began his life living with his mom because his dad was in prison. And then when his dad got out of prison, his mom went to prison. And I certainly wasn't expecting that kind of a story when I sat down with Martin Emerson. And then I was able to get a hold of his dad on the phone. And his dad was just phenomenal. I mean, in both of those stories, uh, Michael's mom and Martin's dad were just 
that, you know, they really helped make the stories. And, um, you know, Martin's dad basically told me everything about what it was like to raise uh, his two sons when, you know, he was, you know, had spent time in prison. And he said, you know, things like you've got to, you know, rebuild your life. You've got to, re you know, you have to make society trust you again. And, you know, one of the, the cool things about that story was the fact that, like, when Martin was in high school, you know, if he, he wanted to go out and do something on a weekend or whatever. He had to work for his dad's landscaping company. So him and his brother, Martel, you know, they were always had to be cutting lawns and doing all that kind of stuff when, you know, there were probably other things they would have rather done. But uh, it was just it was just kind of a cool story. And um, I just sort of felt that Martin had a story. I felt he had a story. And uh, lo and behold, there was something there. So I'm always grateful to get those opportunities. I, I don't know how many like aspiring journalists listen to us, but just just so you know, parents love to talk about their kids. <laughs> That's always when you're when you're writing a feature, all the good stuff comes from comes from the parents or the right. guardians, whoever whoever played that role in a person's life. All the good stuff comes from them. It never fails. In fact, half the time, Mary Kay, right, the story ends up becoming about the parent. It ends <laughs> up becoming more about the parent than the kid. Well, I spent 45 minutes talking to um, Martin Sr. At one point, he was going through a car wash. I mean, we like it was, you know, it was kind of funny. But, um, but he was so very forthcoming about, you know, I, I couldn't even use half of, half, you know, of what we talked about because, you know, he really got, you know, very involved in, you know, what he did to end up in prison and how it happened that way. But, you know, he gave the background of the family and, you know, it, and it became about, you know, being a father and being, you know, learning how to be a man, even when things in your life didn't go right and how he instilled these values in his sons. And it, it, it just took on, you know, a different spin after talking to him. And, and I, again, am very grateful for that interview. All right, here we go. <laughs> Most bizarre moment of the season. Should we, Ashley? Should we just let Mary Kay cook on this one, or is there, or should we? How, yeah, how do we do Mary this? Kay, let <laughs> let Mary Kay start, and then I will jump in after. Like you know, I'll jump in and add my little my little sidebars from my remembrance of the day. Yeah, and I'll stay I, out of the. I'll 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 stay away because that's what I did that week. <laughs> well, you know, so when we tell this story, I mean, it, it just we all have parts and pieces of the story yeah. that made it what it was. Um, and I haven't told this story before anywhere and I and nobody else ever told it either. But um, but I think, you know, it, it sort of makes for a, a good, you know, just uh, pull the curtain and, and show you guys a glimpse of some of the things that that go on in a season. And this was certainly my most bizarre moment of the season for sure. So I will start on uh, Tuesday of Deshaun coming back week. Deshaun is coming back, getting ready to play against the Houston Texans. So here we are, and it's Monday. And, you know, we go so hard during the season, as, as you guys all know. We go so hard during the season. It is hard to stay healthy and well. And especially we've got like, we, you know, we don't really have any windows in our press box and it's kind of, I mean, our, in our media room and it's a little, it's kind of enclosed. <laughs> Let's just say that. Um, it's, it's like a preschool in there. Yeah. yeah. It's like being in preschool. There's germs yeah, there's everywhere. <laughs> germs aplenty in our, in our media room. But anyway, so, um, so I had stayed healthy uh, for most of the season. I was doing great. Um, and here it is. It's Deshaun week and we all want to be healthy. Right. We, you know, this is what, what we've been waiting for him to come back. And um, so on Tuesday, I can't remember when I when I started to get this fever, but I think it might have been Tuesday night somewhere around there. Yeah. Tuesday night. All of a sudden I'm starting to shiver and I'm like, uh oh, this isn't good. And um, so I got a, I had a fever that started on Tuesday night. And on Wednesday, um, I, I had a, like 101, 102 fever for the whole entire day. So I did not go to work. I did not well, go to work. And the other Wednesday. part of that was Tuesday night, you stayed up and did that amazing story with Deshaun's quarterback coach, Quincy Avery. 
Oh, I forgot and about that. That went up on Wednesday morning. So we were like, oh, maybe you're just like run down at that point. Like, we don't know. <laughs> yes, I forgot about that. That was another interview that I was very grateful to get his quarterbacks coach who had worked with him every single day during the 11 game suspension. So I was very grateful to get that. And then by this point, Dan, when did you get diagnosed with COVID that week? T- Tuesday. I think I, I think I tested positive on Tuesday, maybe. It was late okay. Monday or like early Tuesday, something like that. So, so like Dan's, the other, I was going to say Dan. Dan was going to Houston. I was not going to Houston. Right. So Dan tests positive, and suddenly it's Ashley. You might want to book a flight now. The <laughs> the listeners might know this. I you might not know this. Like Dan and I love booking and canceling hotels. So like I still had my Houston hotel booked. I just hadn't canceled it in case something happened. Um, and then, you know, I'm looking at Southwest flights last minute. So we're now to Wednesday and we know Ashley and Mary Kay are set to go to Houston. Yes. And it it was weird because, you know, we can't send every single one of us on the road. So there are some road trips that, uh, that Ashley doesn't get to go on. And this was one that she wasn't going to be able to make. And she was disappointed in that because for obvious reasons and, um, be careful what you wish for, Ashley. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we learned that the hard way. Yeah. So, um, way. <laughs> so Dan's at home with COVID. There's nothing he can do. He's got to stay home, you know? And then, uh, so here I am on, um, on Wednesday thinking, oh my goodness, like I work side by side with Dan every single day and what's going on here. Right. And, uh, now I did test negative. I tested negative for COVID on Wednesday. Um, but I had a fever. I had a fever all day long and I could not get out of bed. I mean, I, I had like a horrible migraine like headache, but that was really kind of it. I mean, it wasn't upper respiratory or anything. I didn't know what was going on, but I had a fever. I stayed home all day, didn't eat anything. I did not eat anything. And then I did not hardly drink anything either. I just was down for the count all day. And, but, okay, so now we get to Thursday, my fever's down and I'm feeling okay. Um, And I'm like, okay, Deshaun's talking today. I got to go to work. I got to get out there and I've got to rally and I have to do this, even though I was kind of weak. But again, fever down, I didn't really have any other symptoms and I was negative for COVID. So I'm like, I can do this. So I go, I'm driving out to Berea and I was okay. You know, I felt fine. I mean, Ashley, you remember you saw me. Uh, Wednesday morning, and I, I seemed, I know I'm, I probably seemed fine, maybe a little. Yeah, we talked about our, our outfits. Like I had a very like Mary Kay style shirt on. We were talking <laughs> about that. Like we're just getting ready. We there's a lot of people around. It's way more crowded than normal because yes. word got out that Deshaun was talking that day. But it's yeah. fairly normal, quick start to the morning. Yeah. So we get into the locker room, and again, it's Deshaun talking day. So you know, there's everybody's kind of milling around. And then we had a couple guys that spoke at the podium before it was going to be Deshaun's turn. And we started waiting for Deshaun to come. And I don't know if he was getting treatment or what was going on. I I think too, just, just so people can get the lay of the land, like in the locker room the they set up like a backdrop and oh, then yeah. they put a little mic stand in front yeah. of it, and there's like there's not a lot of space between the mic stand and then these couches that are right that are right behind it. So everybody's kind of crammed really On close to each other. Yeah. So like yes. like yeah. like when we say podium, it's it's literally just like this tiny a space. Yeah, it's not like what, when you see the press conferences from like the media room or whatever. We're all like right on top yeah. of each other and pretty much right on top of the player too. Yeah, we were packed in, and it was hot. It was hot, and um, and like it was probably eighty degrees in that locker room. Like yeah, to give it, people it was, an idea, like you look at that thermostat in there; it's normally set to like seventy five, seventy six when the weather gets cooler. Like this was at least eighty degrees, I'm sure. Yeah, and and we were waiting, waiting, waiting for Deshaun, and I remember Hayden, uh, Hayden Grove, obviously our colleague, uh, and Tom Withers from the AP, they sat down in front of the cameras because it was so crowded. Uh, I think both of them did. I think they both sat down to be able to, you know, to get a good angle on their phones of Deshaun and make sure they were positioned correctly. So we're waiting, waiting, waiting for Deshaun. And all of a sudden, now I haven't eaten anything. So it's by this time, it's Thursday. And I hadn't eaten anything since Tuesday. 
and or really had much to drink. So I was very dehydrated. And I all of a sudden I start, you know, the room starts to get a little weird, a little funky. And I'm like, oh boy, I know what this feeling is like because when I would, I have three children and I used to faint. I mean, I used to like get, I used to black out and faint when I was pregnant with my three kids. And so I 100% know the feeling. And I, it, I just like, I'm like, uh oh, this is, this is getting dicey. So I knelt down next to Hayden thinking, I got to get down near the floor so that I can get through this. I just got to get through this Deshaun interview and then I can leave. I just have to get through it. That's all I have to do. So I knelt down on the floor next to Hayden and it didn't help. It didn't do anything. The room was still closing in on me. The room was closing in on me. So I got up as best I could. And I'm like, if I can just make it right over there, three feet away to the couch, I'll be all right. I just have to get over to the couch. So I stood up and I started making my way over to the couch and I didn't make it. I did not make it to the couch. I passed out and fainted right there in the middle of the Browns locker room on Deshaun Day when everybody's getting ready for Deshaun to come in and talk. And of course, it was like, at that point, Deshaun like was walked, like he was in the back of the room as Mary Kay fainted. Like, so she had effectively made it there. It was just like two or three minutes, like too late to to actually get to the start of the presser. But yeah, and I know you don't remember much after that. It sounds like we filled you in later. Well, I do remember this part and poor Deshaun. I do remember this part. Tom Withers sprang to action. Everybody did. Everybody was amazing. But Tom Withers sprang to action. He was like, you got to get her something to drink. She's dehydrated. You got like, you got to get something in her. So they got me some Gatorade. I mean, the, the Browns medical staff sprang to action too, because I mean, as we just saw with what happened on the football field last Monday night with DeMar Hamlin, in a situation like this, you have no idea where something like this could possibly go. I mean, it could be very, very, very dangerous, right? And everybody knows the gravity of such a situation. Who knows what this could be? I collapsed, right? So Tom, but I did come to, and Tom Withers was, you know, making sure that I got some Gatorade in me, even, but like, I didn't really want to, but I thought I, I had to. So the minute I took the sip of Gatorade, it came back up on me and I knew it was coming back up. I'm sorry, we're getting graphic, but so they brought over this big garbage can and I, and I was like, get me, I think I was like, get me a garbage can. (laughs) And she was. And then the minute it started coming up, I looked up and there was Deshaun walking like right towards me. And I went right into the garbage can at that moment. I was like, oh, welcome back, Deshaun. Welcome back to, was, you know, welcome back to the field, Deshaun. Holding your hair like we were sorority girls. Like, yes. I was like, I just, I know she doesn't want, I'm like, I know she wants her hair protected. We talk about her hair so much. I have to do this. <laughs> that was so, a girl's yes. girl moment. <laughs> yeah. So Ashley, Ashley held the hair back like she's been taught to do. And, um, and then uh, while this was all going on, well, the first thing they, they did was they decided they were going to move the press conference out of the locker room into the field house. And then they wanted to know if I could walk back to the trainer's room. And I, I couldn't. I mean, I, I, I was like, I'm, I, I can't walk yet. I'm not I'm not up for that yet. So they brought me this enormous wheelchair like you could have put like name me a huge, enormous human being. Could put like uh, five Mary Joel- Kays in it. Yeah. Well, it's like, think about it, it has to be a, a wheelchair that's large enough to fit like a guy like Joel Batonio or Ethan <laughs> Posick, who's six six or Wyatt Teller. Like these wheelchairs have to be bigger than normal wheelchairs. Yeah, you could have yeah, you could have fit like three of me in this wheelchair. So they put me in this wheelchair, which I, I was embarrassed. I did not want to be in a wheelchair. I just kind of wanted to sit where I was until I could, you know, gather myself. But the medical staff was very alarmed by this. They were very alarmed at the point they wanted me to go to the emergency room and figure out what was going on. Cause who knew? Nobody knew if I had a heart attack or what. Right. Um, so, but then I I was trying to say, I haven't eaten since Tuesday. Then people, I think got the impression that I was like starving myself or something. No, 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 no. I had a fever. 
I had a fever. So, um, so they wheeled me back and I, I got to see a part of the Browns facility that I've never seen before. There's a nice, cool room back there, the regen room, and, but they're wheeling me back. And, um, and I, I remember passing Amari and Denzel. They were like, you know, sitting in there, like getting treatment or whatever. And I was like waving to them from my chair, you know, like I was <laughs> a print, you know, like a princess on a float in a parade, you know. But um, so I remember handing Ashley my tape recorder. She that's that was my favorite part of the story is that <laughs> they put you in the wheelchair and you're like, Ashley. And I'm like, what's she going to ask me? And you hand me the recorder and go, take my recorder to the dish on press <laughs> And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and, and mind you, there's like, th- everybody puts a tape recorder up there. And like, yeah. we all, you know, we work together on transscripts and share them. And like, yeah. it just but was a great moment. Mary because Kay was going to get that recorder up there. Like that is the ultimate Mary Kay. I'm worried about the job and how to do the job. Like moment that I was like, yeah, absolutely. I will make sure you have this, this audio if you need it. What's yeah. all I could think. What I really wanted to do was say, can we just do this after practice so I can be a part of it? But no, I, you know, I was, I was going home, but, um, so they, you know, that, so I went into a trainer's room, the Browns medical staff, they were all phenomenal. I mean, they, I mean, it really goes to show you how good these people are. I mean, they, they know what to do. They know how to handle these situations. I thought about that during, you know, I mean, they were just heroes during the DeMar Hamlin situation. Um, but they, you know, they took all my vitals. They called an ambulance. Uh, when the paramedics came, uh, everything was stable. Everything was cool. I, you know, my heart was fine. My heartbeat, every, you know, all my vitals were good. So it was my choice whether or not to go to the emergency room. And I chose not to, uh, because I felt like I was fine. And then you guys called, some of the writers called my husband and, you know, he came and picked me up and, um, and that was Deshaun Watson's, uh, first, first day being interviewed by the Cleveland media. But I did now I stayed home the next day, like a good girl, right? I stayed home on Thursday, on Friday, Friday, I stayed home on Friday. Um, but on Saturday, I got on that plane and I, I went to Houston. But the plane took like an, got an hour or so delay. And yes. they did not have the air conditioning on on your plane during that time. Exactly. Yeah, that was a little dicey. But nevertheless, made it down to Houston, got through it, felt fine by game day. Um, but poor Ashley had oh, to... Uh, She had to cover us that week because Dan was home with COVID and I was home with whatever. And, uh, and it was Deshaun week. And it was Deshaun week. I mean, all that happened, like they wheel Mary Kay away. And like, I mean, I'm saying, standing there with her, Scott Petrak from the Chronicle is also stayed behind. Like we're, we're making sure she's okay. And they take her away back to the training room and they're like, all right, we're going to do the Deshaun presser. So then Scott and I, come out of the locker room and run down the hall and get in the field house and like pass to Sean, who's just standing there waiting to come out. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. I'm like, I don't even know what's happening. I'm texting Dan. I'm texting our boss. I'm trying to let all these people know what's happening and that she's okay, but this has happened. And like, I'm here now and we're asking questions and, and we're doing it. But then I, I, you know, we get through the next two days. And um, again, I always say, I told Mary Kay this after I'm like, I couldn't, you know, even I could never be Mary Kay, but even having to do a fraction of what she does in a week, it was, you know, a very big learning experience and very stressful, but we made it through. And then I knew she was fine, fine after the game on Sunday when we're going to the post game. And Mary Kay's always like, has to make sure she's there. So she always runs normally. She like jogs in high heels. It's quite a <laughs> feat. And she started jogging on Sunday. And I'm like, she's back. She's fine. This is totally, this is great. She's fine. We've made it. <laughs> oh my gosh. What a week. What a week. And I mean, you did a great job, Ash, uh, holding it all together. But, you know, Dan and I just crashed both in the same week. It was, it was the yeah. worst time. The worst, week, was... the worst week to do it. Like, we couldn't do it during, like, Bucks week. We had to do well, it during right. Deshaun. 
And like Dan, like we kept joking about this, about like jokingly saying, oh, one of us should request like a vacation or take time off next week. And then like two days later, you tested positive. And like I had ridden in a car with you on that like two days before to the game. Uh, yeah, the we, were a little, game. we were a little nervous we were going to lose Ashley there too. Yeah, I um, thought for sure. I'm like, we might just all be down for the count for this game. And I never, never got it to my knowledge, you know, still have never gotten COVID to my knowledge, but um, it was just a crazy, crazy time and just having to talk about having to adjust on the fly for a lot of this stuff that week. Yeah. Uh, okay. Ashley's got to go see Hamilton for like the 20th yeah. time. So six <laughs> time, yeah. Ashley. Wow. This is number it's six. A, number six. Yes. I've seen it. I saw it twice in Cleveland in 2018. Um, I did see it once in New York on actual, you know, actual Broadway in the actual Richard Rogers theater. Um, I saw it once in Detroit, and now I've seen it twice in Cleveland this go around. So it's I'm very excited. Yay. All right, well enjoy enjoy that. Speaking of running, Mary Kay and Ashley both had to like sprint across the field in Atlanta. But we oh, will. Yeah, that, that, uh, we'll... I'm really upset we don't have video of that. That was just well, like, can we? I'll tell that story quick. We get downstairs, and we don't really know where we're going. And us two were like literally, I think like the last two writers out of the press box. So there's no one for us to really follow, which is the, normally what you do on the road. You just kind of see where the home writers go and find out, find your way from there. Um, and we ask a security guard and they're like, we need to get to the visitor's locker room. And he's like, the quickest way is just going to be cutting across the field. So Mary <laughs> Kay and I ran on that Mercedes-Benz Stadium turf, 100 plus yards down the field. And I did not have the like foresight to to grab my phone and record it because that would have been kind of a cool video i must say um, that would have been yeah, a we, cool video. we ran the length i'm not joking the length of the field yeah and i had turf. heels on heels on heels had heels on <laughs> well Luckily, it's a fast track down there. As we oh, saw yeah. at the Ohio track. State Georgia. Yeah. Game. So when when I say that is a fast, that's fast turf down there. I know what I'm talking about. First hand <laughs> experience. Yep. All right, there we go. That'll do it for this edition of the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. Uh, Football Insiders, uh, if you want to get involved, cleveland.com slash Browns, the blue banner at the top of the page, texting a newsletter, access to those stories on cleveland.com slash Browns. And of course, subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts. Leave us a five-star review. And on Spotify, also search Cleveland Browns on cleveland.com if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We put our podcast up there. And we've got videos uh from press conferences practices uh it's it's worth your time subscribing there as well so again just search cleveland browns on cleveland.com on youtube for mary Kay and ashley i'm dan thanks for listening everybody